and it is my privilege and honor to introduce her. Dr. Monica White is an Associate Professor of Environmental Justice at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a joint appointment in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies in the Department of Community and Environmental Sociology. She is also the former president of the board, the former president of the board of directors for the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Dr. White is the first African American woman to earn tenure in the College of Agricultural Life Sciences at the University of Wisconsin Madison mm -hmm. and teaches mm -hmm. courses mm -hmm. <laughs> and teaches courses in environmental justice, urban agriculture, and community food systems. Her research investigates communities of color and grassroots organizations engaged in developing sustainable community food systems as a strategy to respond to issues of hunger and food is inaccessibility. She is the author of Freedom Farmers, Agricultural Resistance, and the Black Freedom Movement. <laughs> the book traces the origins of black farming organizations to the late 1800s, emphasizing their activities during the late 1960s and early 1970s. I bought this book the day it was released, and I can testify to its power and revelation. Um, for me, Dr. Monica White is a mentor, advisor, comrade, and inspiration. I'm grateful that she agreed to do this talk in my hometown and can assure <laughs> and can assure y'all that you are in for a real treat. Please join me in welcoming her. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, and I, my first question or is or a request is that you tell us about little Monica. So, what was she like? Did she ever think or have an idea that she might be writing a book about black farmers one day? So, the vision for writing a book about farmers was not a vision that Little Monica had. But I'll tell you what Little Monica did. Um, I, I was a part of the generation that my parents were the ones who joined the migration. So, my mother's from Eden, North Carolina, and my father's from Mobile, Alabama. All right, and yeah. every summer, we would go to one of the two places. My grandfather was a farmer, and it wasn't until after I finished the last edits of the book that I found out that he was a leader of a co-op. So they say all of writing is autobiographical, and even every time I say it, I always think about my granddaddy, Pearl, uh, granddaddy uh, Kenneth, and my grandma Pearl because you know the, the stars aligned for um, for this vision, and it was bigger than me. So I was always hanging out with growers. You know, my dad grew food from you know in Detroit. Um, my granddaddy, my uncle, like folks in my family, and I just wanted to be out where they were doing what they were doing. And I was one of those inquisitive kids. It was always okay. Well, why? Okay, well, why? Okay, well, why that? Okay, well, why that? And I was always fascinated by the the work and the love that my family had for working the soil, but also not just working the soil, but also sharing the bounty. So my dad was a professor of educational psychology at Wayne State University, but they also called him Farmer White because there was a grocery store called Farmer Jack. And so he would always, you know, grow food and take it to church and, you know, share. He was known for his feijoada, which is a Brazilian dish. And he cooked and people, he, that was his love language. And so it was from growing up, hanging out with folks who grew food, who connected that relationship between land, food, and freedom, um, feeding folks as a, com, you know, as, as a part of love, um, that I became really interested in asking those kinds of questions. So I didn't, as little Monica, know that I would even be interested in farmers. Uh, but I'm really grateful that, that, that my path was lined in that direction. Mm -hmm. So who did you write this book for and why? Can you talk to us about your intentions in writing it? Yes. Thank you. I, I, I wrote this book for us. I wrote this book for us. I um, had moved back to Detroit to care for my parents, and there was this urban act movement that was taking flight, and folks were talking about it, and there were pictures, but I didn't see us. And let me say, my daddy grew food, my grandmother was in a wheelchair, she had a container garden before it was such a thing as a container garden. Mm -hmm. She was like, baby, you know, you walked in, baby, go water grandma's tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, to hear and to see the view of food production in Detroit and the folks who were involved in it, 
and to read the stories, it was a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So Toni Morrison tells us if there's a book that you want to read that hasn't been written, you are the one to write it. And so I didn't see us in the ways that folks were talking about urban agriculture. I didn't hear, you know, I didn't see anybody who looked like me in terms of Detroit. And so what was also important was, um, the first book was supposed to be about urban ag in Detroit. Um, and then I realized in order for me to set example of Detroit as a case study, I had to have a theoretical foundation for that work. And so that meant I can't start in Detroit, I have to start in the South. Mm -hmm. So that led me to hang out with some really beautiful, incredible folks down South who taught me, who let me hang out and pick up trucks and who would, you know, we do wild hog sausage or whatever, you know, and you know, so I would spend my days in the archives and at night I would um, ask them questions about things that didn't really make sense. So in studying or in looking at what the conversation, the previous scholarship was about black farmers, it was a negative frame, it was a deficit model, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so it was always conversations of slavery, tenant farming, and sharecropping, mm -hmm. aging farmers, mm -hmm. land loss, mm -hmm. land dispossession. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, look, y'all, if, if we use the land to get free, this can't be a frame. Mm -hmm. And the way my anxiety is set up, I got, you got to give me something positive, right? Because I'm like, there's got to be another reason that when we have these economic downturns that black folk turn to the land, there has to be another reason for that outside of the negative deficit phrase. And so, once again, you know, sort of recognizing that there was a deficit in embracing the legacy of agriculture and acknowledging the importance of agriculture and bringing that story forward as we figure out what new cities, how we, re how we design new cities around agriculture and not just agriculture um, that's expensive, that is, you know, unaffordable in, in some neighborhoods, but for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the book because I felt like it was important for us to give our children a conversation to shift the frame and to say this food production is righteous, it's rooted, it's the right thing to do at the right time in the right ways, and I just wanted them to have something to turn to to change that conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So that was why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. So what is this agricultural resistance and freedom movement that you refer to? So if you look up agricultural resistance, if it doesn't refer to me, it usually means it talks about sort of uh, <laughs> one thing you need to know about me, I will change a, the definition of something to meet my needs. Like if I don't like it, I'm going to make it work for me and for us. So a lot of times people talk about it in terms of um, the capacity for plants to adjust and to resist various kinds of, you know, chemicals or whatever, you know, just plants and seeds are amazing and incredible and they resist the transformation of change. For me, agricultural resistance is, <coughs> let me, let me back up just a, a minute. So when you think, I'm a sociologist and I study social movements and in order to understand the way that people challenge systems and structures, most of the time we talk about protests, marches, and boycotts, right? And so all of that energy is outward. So there are disruptive resistance strategies, like Matt said, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'll stand in front of your building and I won't let you in. There are non-disruptive strategies, like I'm going to do a hunger strike, or I'll put a bow, or I'll tie a bow around a tree, or something to let folks know that I'm mad. I'm like, I'm not going to take it anymore. But in both of these cases, those energies are directed outward to those entities that are oppressive. So for me, agriculture offers a different way of looking at how folks resist, right? Talk to folks in the D, talk to many beautiful people here. Like the reason that you're growing food is resistance, but it's just not formally seen as resistance by the academy. And so a constructive strategy means building the kind of world that we want to see using food production. And so this agricultural resistance is not just in terms of uh, growing food, but it's all the different ways that we have fought for the right to carry the seeds, to feed ourselves, to use the produce to celebrate. It traces from seeds in our hair through the Middle Passage, to the demand for provision grounds during slavery, to, I mean, all kinds of different ways historically that we fought for the right to grow the food that we, you know, that we want, that, that represents our culture. And I just didn't hear anything that really captured a constructive form of resistance I feel like all of necessary. Sometimes you do have to stop some stuff from happening. Sometimes you do need to stop a bit, right? Sometimes you do need to have a silent form of protest. But I don't think that we should entertain only those that are directly in opposition. We also have to build what works for us. Yes. And so that's where the constructive comes from. And so agricultural resistance is a, a, a concept that recognizes 
the use of and creation of community-based food systems, including everything from the seed to the harvest and the ways that we get free. So how does it um, connect to black folks in our communities today? Um, yeah. So let me just, I didn't answer your question about um, the, uh, the freedom movement. The freedom movement is everything that has ever happened, all the ways that we have fought for our freedom. Mm -hmm. From the moment that we were, you know, approached on the continent, okay. right? Starting so with everything that yeah. we do, um, uh, the black freedom movement entails, I mean, just centuries of resistance and resilience for black folks. So, um, the other question. So how does it connect to black folks in our communities today? Yeah. Why is it important for us to understand the history of agriculture? I want us to know that this is not new. Mm -hmm. That we've been doing this, y'all, right? I don't have to let the news tell me. I don't have to let CNN. I don't need to see those pictures of other folks. I can see a reflection of myself in our history. And so what is incredibly powerful, the words that I heard from the folks at D-Town, you know, used to sort of, like, as a researcher, you, you kind of, like, weren't walking through the world. You're like, okay, well, well, this is something interesting I think I want to study. And then you're kind of like, oh, I heard this. Mm -hmm. I heard this food is freedom. Growing food is freedom. Okay, well, I hope I can... Well, I hope I can trace this historically. Well, I hope there's something there. Mm -hmm. So then I met Reverend Wendell Paris, who told me, you can free yourself when you can feed yourself. Amen. Amen. Yes. So I'm like, Amen. whoa, bro, this is exactly, <laughs> right? These are the ideas. And so I tried to find these elements, these aspects, these moments of a historical analysis of how we've used food to get free and bring that forward so you all don't have to be the one in the archives. I can give it to you in such a way that you can use it, you can create curricula around it, you can use it in your meetings to support the work that you're doing. And so um, that is, we absolutely see, we're in a critical moment. Let me say, we're in a critical moment. Um, uh, farmers are experiencing crises. I mean, and these are just traditional, conventional farmers, right? We're talking about folks who've been farming for generations in the Midwest, their capacity to stay on the land and what have you. Um, and so, we all need to be concerned with, with what's going on in terms of where our food comes from, how it's grown, where the seeds, how it's nourished, and those kinds of things. And this book shows us that there have been other examples. And I wanted us to see what those examples look like and to talk about the ways that they use food as the center. Because I think the biggest thing for me was to recognize how powerful the conversation is. Folks are like, okay, so um, if we can grow our own food, then what else can we do? Yeah. Right? Can we run our own schools? Yeah. Right? Can we protect ourselves in terms of safety and security? Can we, you know, what else can we do? So the conversation of food is only the beginning of what it takes for a whole freedom sort of framework and so I just really wanted to bring that from the past so that you all would would, would have some examples to support the work that you're doing. So that's beautiful and a beautiful transition to my next question which is kind of long so I'm going to read it. Um, I love how you take us on a journey discussing different movement, different movements, cooperatives, and collectives. At one point, you mentioned that Brother Malcolm and Dr. King, among others, recognized the connection between land, agriculture, education, and poverty. Can you talk to us about how you see agriculture positioned at the center of that relationship? And maybe a little bit about how people like Fannie Lou Hamer and the Black Panther Party saw food and land being connected to political resistance and freedom. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> chapter where I just sort of talk about the trajectory of food as strategy. I really wanted to root this conversation in a bigger frame that allowed us to see that our civil rights leaders have made that connection. It's just that we lost that piece. Come on. Right? When we moved from the land, we moved into cities. Fanny mm. Kramer said, don't leave the land. Everything comes from the land. You leave the land, you become beholden to somebody else. Right? And so, um, uh, uh, Brother Malcolm and Dr. King, they saw that and they were, tr they were offering that to us. They were saying, okay, so as a strategy, here are the things that we need to be mindful of. And so I just wanted to further root the argument in folks that we know and love. Yes, yes. And to see that they were already telling us what we need to be, right? They gave us a gift, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. gave us a gift. And that gift is something that I wanted to put in the forefront of our faces so that we could then connect that and, and use it as strategy. So, the, okay, so I talked about Dr. King and Brother Malcolm. Let's see, what was the other part of your question? 
Uh, agriculture being at the center of land, um, poverty, all of that relationship. So I, it is, um, to me, I think the, in some ways we, we're, always, we're often thinking about education. I think we don't often think about food in that particular, at least before this current moment, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe five years ago, we weren't really talking about food in these particular ways. We weren't talking about food insecurity. We weren't talking about food access in the ways that we're talking about it now. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was elevated to the same kind of level because as Dara Cooper, who's an <laughs> activist, she says that uh, hunger is violence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A lack of access to nutrient-rich food in our neighborhood is violence. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that Mrs. Hamer said, okay, so we were in Mississippi, we were the majority in Mississippi, and had we stayed in Still Mississippi. Alive. Right, right, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, what they say. Yes, thank Still you, thank you. <laughs> and so to recognize the people power there in Mississippi, it was necessary for there to be some uses or some ways to divert us away from where we were powerful. And the strategy that was used was oppression. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, was, was hunger. And so Mrs. Hamer saw hunger as oppressive. And in the same way, she said, if this is the instrument of oppression, then how about feeding folks and using that as a strategy of resistance and resilience? Mm -hmm. And so I just you know, took these concepts and these conversations and tried to tie them together the way we see it historically, and to use that as an example of, of, of what we can be doing now, the things that we should be, are thinking about, right? We're already thinking about these things. We're already working in these areas. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to provide the framework and the lens to know that we are inheriting a legacy a deep, rich legacy that it doesn't matter where we are. Like, you know, we didn't leave the South and leave our seeds. We grew backyard gardens. Like, you know, we have always grown food as long as there have been black folk in cities. Mm -hmm. I said people in cities, but especially black folk. We grow what we love and what we know. Mm -hmm. And so community, I mean, growing in urban agriculture isn't new. There's a different newness, <laughs> right? But I just really wanted us to connect and to anchor our work in a tradition and in a yes. history and to mm -hmm. understand that we inherit this legacy mm -hmm. and it's ours, it belongs to us and it's also important that we make sure we add a little something to it so that we offer something for our children. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those strategies um, outlined in your book for building self-determined communities and resisting oppressive structures? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here's what I did. So the, for the for the uh, academic for the you know just if you're interested, I'm just gonna put it out there and you know just talk a little bit about how I collected the data, how I analyzed it, and the theoretical framework that came about as a result of the analysis of the data. So originally, I was gonna write the book from 1880 to 20 something. Mm -hmm. So my friend Sundiata Chajua, he was like, Mo, he's a historian. He's like, Mo, you can't write no book. Oh, you can't get that. You gotta get tenure. So I decided to narrow down the analysis of the specific organizations to the 1960s, which is called the Southern Cooperative Movement. And here was a time where we had fought for the right to vote, and yet once we voted, we were fired because we were offered shared crops and tenant farmers, um, or uh, fired and evicted from our jobs. So at a moment when you were completely beholden to somebody that you knew was exploiting you, and then Mrs. Hamer offered Freedom Farm as an example. I just felt, I, I just, you know, just sort of thinking about what must it have felt like to be completely beholden to somebody that you know is taking advantage of you, to then having an opportunity where you can be free, you can use your skills, you can work collectively, and create a whole community around food. And so I collected from a, a several, about 40 organizations, I just kind of kept a, a log of what were the organizations, where were they based, what year, and then a list of all the things they did. I took all the things that they did and I organized them into categories. And there were three categories or strategies that came as a result of that. One strategy was what I call commons as praxis. Commons as praxis is an idea that says if we all need it, then we all should be involved in making decisions about it. Mm -hmm. So you can't put something in the water just because you own this lake mm -hmm. and think that that's the end of it, right? So we collectively decide how to use these resources. So commons as praxis includes seeds, water, land, all those kinds of things that we need. Praxis is a fancy word that just means theory and practice. Mm -hmm. How do you combine it? Right? How do you, you know, how do you explain it? How do you? What importance does it have? And then how do you implement it? So that's commons as practice. The other one is economic autonomy and independence. Now, in a global economy, it's difficult. It's sort of like an infinity. It's like you're moving toward it, uh, but you're still under the rubric of, of, a, of a global economy. 
So for me, it's the creation of alternative means of exchange, right? So in some cases, we might barter. Mm -hmm. Like at D-Town, you volunteer so many hours, you get D-Town dollars, you can exchange the D-Town dollars for the produce that you just contributed to. Um, there are other ideas that say an hour's worth of labor for an hour's worth of labor. Because in a capitalist system, we place value on what people do based on how we feel about those careers. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you that if something happens with your plumbing, don't call me. You call a plumber. <laughs> but when you think about how people are, you know, sort of respected in a society, we sort of place value of one over the other. And the idea of an hour's worth of labor for an hour's worth of labor equalizes and says we're all important, we're all valuable. And so in doing that, then, you know, I, you know, you, uh, you know, you might do my kids or I might, you know, uh, uh, you know, mow the lawn or something, you know, to that effect, but it sort of equalizes. And so using this economic autonomy as a strategy, people take the dollar out of the decision making mm -hmm. and we respect each other for what it is that we contribute. Mm -hmm. The other idea, um, the other strategy is prefigurative politics. And that isn't my phrase. Prefigurative politics is sort of just a way of saying act as if. And so in a lot of these societies where we were um, not able to vote, in the organizations we were able to vote, there was an element of political education. It was important for us to sort of not just talk about um, what is, but learn about what some opportunities and possibilities could be. And so this political education is an important component of it. And so prefigurative politics just says that while we're not allowed to do certain, not, we don't have the right to do certain things outside, within our organizations, we're going to sort of talk about and engage in ways that are respectful. And so three, these three categories make up the theoretical framework, which is collective agency and community resilience. And so with agency, we often talk about it as a psychological construct. What is it that made you decide to go out and march, protest, boycott, grow food? But it fails to capture the collective component. What happens when a community converts a vacant land into a growing space where there's music and medicine and you know all kinds of wonderful things to happen? So that collective component becomes important. Resilience is a very laden term, mm -hmm. and I problematize it in this way. Mm -hmm. Usually when we talk and think about resilience, we think about it in terms of catastrophic event, people come and support each other, and isn't that wonderful? And it is, mm -hmm. right? It is great. Mm -hmm. But to stop there is to do us all a disservice. If we don't further interrogate the structures that created yeah. certain communities to be vulnerable to begin with, then that's a failure on our part. So collective agency and community resilience is a way that we push back against the social structures that have created vulnerabilities for us as black folk in this country, in this world. Um, and so it says, yes, we're incredible because we look out for each other. And we also push back against the structures that create the vulnerability to begin with. So the theoretical framework is collective agency and community resilience with the three strategies of common sense praxis, economic autonomy, and prefigurative politics. Does that make sense? Take notes? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to ask some questions. So if anything doesn't make sense, you all feel free. I do want this. We're going to open up the floor so we can have some, some back and forth because I, I really want to make sure that we have a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. um, so next question is a little bit into your personal journey. Um, why academia? Did you ever feel like you had to choose between your scholarship and your practical work in activism? What role do you see scholar activists playing in the fight for black people? Mm. Were you asking me that at Mark Lamont Hills? Like his joint? Like his body? Okay, okay, okay. Why academia? So I came from an educated background. Uh, my parents, my father was an educational psychologist. My mom was a teacher. And um, so books have been my friends. You know, the academy was the place where you, I had books in my bed. You know, I mean, you know, just books everywhere. You know, just I was comforted by learning. And so the academy was where I felt safe. I felt smart. I felt like I contribute. And, um, it was my it was my 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 form of resistance. Last semester, the class before me, um, the faculty member had gone over, and so I'm standing in the hallway. I walk up, and the students are standing there, and so I'm like, "Well, I'm just gonna open the door." I'm like, "You you know you chop chop." So, <laughs> so I go, and the student looked at me and said, a, a white male student who said, "I'd let the professor handle that." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing it wasn't Monique, it's a good thing it was Monica right. who showed up to class that day because I just kind of looked at him and I was like, well, what makes you think I'm not? What, 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 what
face flush and for the rest of the semester apologize. I mean profusely, just like, oh my goodness. And so I, I, I'm like, you know, well, I need you to understand the assumptions that you made, right? So for me, my presence in the academy is resistance. And I feel, I've always felt like, I love Audre Lorde. I have always sort of pushed back against that statement, using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Because it depends on what you consider the master's tools to be. Yeah. If the academy on, is the master's tool, right? If you can define the academy as that tool, then to me, I'm going to take it, I'm going to shape it, I'm going to frame it in a way that leads to our freedom. Mm -hmm. So it was always a place where I was challenged by the complexity, but I fought against making the complex even more complex, with, which is what the academy insists on doing. So if you're reading the book, and you think you need a sociology dictionary, I don't think you do. I really hope you don't. I wanted to write this in a way that it flowed, that it made sense, that you could, you didn't feel like it was an academic book, but you mess around and learn something, right? And so I do believe that the academy is a place where we have to be because, I mean, we have to be everywhere. We cannot let any structure be unfought. Right? You know, we, we can't not be there too. And so it was because of my upbringing that I have found the Academy as the place uh, for me to resist. Um, I have your question about um, did I feel like I had to choose? I feel like the institutions would expect me to feel like I had to choose. Mm -hmm. But I resisted that. Yes. And there are ways that the academy, you know, the academy says you have to write and using this language, you have to, you know, here are the things that you have to do to be an academic. Yes. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. But here are the ways that I'm going to stay rooted in my community. Yes. And I would yes. run meetings from uh, board meetings from the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network from my laptop in my Madison office. Right? Because you would do what you had to do for the job, but I also wanted to make sure that I was doing what I needed to do for the community, for the, for the, for the movement. And so there have been situations where institutions have expected me to make those choices, and that's why I'm no longer at those institutions. Mm. So if I have to choose between the academy and the community, like the academy's not going to win. Mm. So I have to carve this in a way that's going to allow me to be right with my soul, so that all is right with my soul. And if that meant working longer, we did that, right? If it meant extra hours if it meant driving to and from Detroit, you know, I mean, just whatever it meant, that, that those were the choices that, that I thought were important. Um, let's see, um, what is the role of, uh, what do I see, uh, the, a scholar activist playing in the fight for, for liberation? So, with that question, I think our job is as sort of intermediaries, mm -hmm. or as Belinda Robnett calls, uh, bridge builders. Right. So I think that it's important that we know what's happening in the academy, and sometimes people use a language that is intentionally mm -hmm. confusing. Mm -hmm. We need to be there, That's right. and we need folks that are multilingual. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be able yeah. to speak, you know, hey, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And good afternoon, how are you doing? Well, what I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, not, and I'm not saying code switch. I'm just saying, like, whatever you say, I need to know what it means. If you created a concept, I need to know what that means. And as soon as I know what that means, it's not for me to keep. I have to share that information. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, is the role of scholar activists. It's our job to make the complex simple, help us understand how it relates to our lives, and remind us of our own power. And so we can use the tools of the academy to do that. And I think to leave the academy or to, 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 to deny that there is a place for us, or to, it, 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 I think that that would do us a disservice. Mm -hmm. Because I think that um, the academy offers us a list of, um, a, 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 a lens through which to understand various options that exist, but also give us the tools to think of new ways to resist um, that I think um, uh, would, would benefit from, from the intellectual sort of enterprise. So definitely a role for the for scholar activists. And can I just talk about black academics? Yes. Yes. Oh, no. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what? Okay. So um, a part of... Um, Akiri Ann uh, Rockmore, who runs the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, tells us that we should be thinking about our careers in chapters. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at post tenure, um, having gotten the book out into the world, um, I just was sort of thinking about how do I share both my methodological and theoretical frameworks with other folks. Um, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is an incredible organization of black led, beautiful black people that are working on our behalf for our freedom. Mm -hmm. And these are folks who are involved in all forms and aspects, elements of the food system. 
And so they're, wor they're working so hard for us. And so to me, as an academic, we have access to resources, we can answer questions, we can do census data, we can do GIS. There's so many things that we can do that our organizations need. And so I wanted to find a way. So if you don't know about the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, you need to check them out. If your organization is black-led, you need to join, figure out how you can be down. Um, and if you're somebody who has some intellectual skills, we don't require any level of degree. But we are trying to create the space for black-led organizations who have needs to provide those needs. And so it may be we need to figure out why are these numbers so crazy when it comes to how we understand black farmers? Is there an increase or really a decrease? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, how do we read this stuff? And these are a group of folks, a group of black folks who want to lend their intellectual um, skills as you're, as you're a part um, to, to support the organizations in those ways. And so to me, it's important to find ways to make sure that um, if organizations need it, then they are our black folks that they can trust and go to and say, look, Monica, I need this, and that we can provide that through the collective of, of black, uh, black scholars. And so and I just think that there are important ways that academics can contribute to our movement, and that is just one of the tangible ways. It's sort of like my job now is to make sure I share the skills and the way I look at the world and with as many folks as I possibly can because we have a lot of work to do and there are lots of rich ideas. I can't do it by myself. I need help. And how do I do that is by reaching out with young, brilliant young people like Ashley to, you know, to support and to figure out, like, how do we share this? How do we make sure that this information is shared and passed on? Mm -hmm. Did I answer that? Yes. Very much so. Um, I got two more questions and then we're going to open it up okay. to the audience. Sure. Are there actions that you hope come out of folks reading this book? Are you hoping folks have specific reflections while after reading it? Mm -hmm. One thing I want us to really seriously do, and I don't know um, how it happened, when it happened, or what happened, but we have a particular view of food producers. Mm -hmm. And the stereotype is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. right? So one thing that I did in the book was I upset the USDA by challenging the definition of who a farmer mm -hmm. is. Yes. Right, so usually it's a capitalist definition that examines relationship to land ownership. It's not the person who works the land, it's the person who owns the land is how a farmer is defined. So for me, that misses all of the labor that built the nation, right? So I expanded it and includes the backyard gardener because I'm talking about folks who grow the food that we need, that we eat, right? Even in the conditions where there are folks who grow food that are food insecure themselves. Yep. And just imagine, the, to me, that, that's an atrocity, right? Mm -hmm. How do you have folks who, um, who are growing food and yet can't eat the food that they grow? Mm -hmm. So what I want, one of the things I want from having written the book is for us to think differently about our agricultural past mm -hmm. and to really embrace who our producers are, the history and the legacy of the centuries of black yes. folk who have been connected to yes. the land and have been disrespected, disregarded, mm -hmm. and ignored. Mm -hmm. Their voices muted. I want to unearth those voices and to elevate them. That's, right. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want, would love to see is for us to centralize food production as we figure out what these new cities look like. Mm -hmm. Right? Our infrastructure in cities, the, the infrastructure is crumbling. And we have to come up with something new. Detroit is a, an example of what happens, an extreme example of what happens when the economic bottom falls out. It uh, creates an opportunity. So one of the analogies that I often use is um, there was a Detroit um, uh, a journalist who wrote a book on Detroit called Detroit, an American Autopsy. Mm. Like, mm. can you tell that to the people in the D that I know and love who are there representing who love? I mean, you know, to be uh, have an autopsy, it has to be what? Yeah. Okay. And you go to the D and you'll see everything but. Mm -hmm. Then there's a sister who, Passion, who um, created an organization called Detroit Dirt. And um, she takes zoo poop and converts it into rich compost. And so instead of calling for an autopsy, we call the transformation of Detroit compost. The previous iteration provides the nutrients for the new iteration. Mm -hmm. And I just really would love for us to centralize the conversation around nutrient-rich food, mm -hmm. food production, and allow us to enjoy the fruits of our labor by, you know, seeing a regenerative model instead of an extractive model and benefiting from and building communities in those particular ways. So I would love for us to think about, now I know, you know, people always ask me, do you grow? 
I mean, you know, it's one of the questions, like, do you grow, what do you grow? I travel a lot, but I have a black farmer on speed dial everywhere. I, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, Mr. Pierce grows, you know, like, I'm, Mr. Pierce, you got some lots of kale, you got some dinosaurs. Okay, meet me at the parking lot, of, and he will meet me with a nice, you know, his honey crisp by the bomb, he grew some white cucumbers. and So I just want us to understand the, the beauty of food production. I understand the depth and the breadth of what food production allows us to do mm -hmm. and to challenge our perceptions of our ancestors who mm. were food producers. Because we, mm. when we left the land, we also allowed other people to shape the impression yes. of who the people were yes. on the land. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that, in dealing with Booker T. Washington in the book, it, it was fraught. You know, it was, it was hard for me to, like we, you know, uh, 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 you know, Booker T and I, we boxed. I mean, it was, it was like, okay, so, you know, I was an activist in the 80s. We, you know, sat in, pre you know, the president of the university office. And we were like, okay, no, you can't take our money and tell us, you know, you can't tell, tell us what you're going to do. You have to consult. You know, we were doing all this. And so for us, Booker T was the opposite, what we shouldn't do. And that's not to say that he didn't say some things that were deeply hurtful and mad problematic, but to understand who he was in that particular time without also recognizing what he contributed to black agriculture. You can't just look at one person and reduce them to a, a, a school, an art, or a Booker T was this. And, you know, so I just really think that we need to offer that nuance and use that nuance to really interrogate why we believe what we believe and if we expand our understanding of agriculture and the importance of agriculture for our freedom, what other strategies do we come up with and how can we then honor and elevate the labor of those who came before us in a way that gives us a blueprint of what we need to be doing in cities today. Mm -hmm. So that to me is really like, if you get anything from this, I want us to feel the strength of who it means, what it means to be a farmer. Um, the joy of connecting our labor <laughs> to the land and an honor and respect for those who, who went before. Mm -hmm. On whose shoulders we stand. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that you wrote this book for black folks. Mm -hmm. uh, have you, in your all the talks and tours that you've done on this book, have you had any off-the-wall responses from non-black folks? You know, I probably have, but I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't hold them. Okay. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure I have. <laughs> but it's just not anything I hold on to, okay. right? Um, you know, I'm kind of a person who believes that what you concentrate on grows. <laughs> so I really don't want nobody coming at me sideways, you know? So I really don't want to add any energy in that direction. Um, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but I just can't think of anything. It's just not anything that I commit to memory. What I can tell you is... Um, um, so... As I was anticipating the, the birthing of this book baby, <laughs> uh, I had all, I have colleagues who have had very horrible experiences by saying what they thought, putting it out into the world. Um, one of my colleagues, who um, is now a judge in Dane County, had said, you know, I don't think every crime deserves incarceration. These crazy folks put his address in the newspaper, death threats, threatened his children. It's a brother who's like, you know, it's like, I mean, make a common sense statement, right? So I had this vision of what was going to happen. I was like, okay, if well, somebody's on my yard, they come in the front, this is what I'm going to do. Like, literally, this is the fear that you have because you just don't know in this moment. You don't know who's going to come for you, what's going to happen, what you're going to do, right? So I had a plan. I was like, okay, so if this goes left, this is what we're going to do. Okay, so-and-so here. All right, Detroit always got me. You know, I got folks in Milltown, 414. I mean, I'm, I'm literally am thinking about what, could, what awful could happen, and I never thought about the beauty, right? 